suck gas evildoers welcome to the saint canard files a dark winged up podcast i'm your host will santana and i'm mike russo and yes i recognize your trademark witty repartee <laughs> hey mike how's it going man um pretty good um for our listeners who've been following um what we've been up to the last few months when this one drops i'll finally be back at work oh okay it's- man mike this episode, there's something that really, really bothers me, man. It's, it's yeah. really, really bad. Um, and, and it's not the storyline, but there, there's something that bothers me that it hurts it so bad overall, dude. At least yeah. for me. Any of you guys who are familiar with this one, you know where we're going with this. But mm-hmm. uh, we'll make you wait on exactly what we're talking about. Okay. Well, Mike, real <laughs> quick, though, man. I'm kind of curious. Uh, are you caught up on the new DuckTales? Yes. Yes. Okay, you you are caught up. Are, are you waiting for it to come back, or is it even coming back, or what's going on with that? Oh Lord, who knows? Um, I really hope it's back by the end of the summer, but mm-hmm. with COVID and everything, and it set everything back. I have no idea when Ducktales is coming back. I don't think anybody does. Okay, I, I, I know what up. I know we have a lot of our followers on Instagram that come from the new DuckTales, and uh, I know we have uh, people who listen to the podcast mainly because of the new DuckTales. Uh, I hate to disappoint them, but I- I've lost a lot of interest, Mike. I've lost a lot of interest with this third season, man. Yeah, um, the, the third season's kind of been all over the place. I don't yeah, disagree. Yeah, and what's, what's sad is, to me, uh, this is going to be very contradicting. What I enjoyed about it at the first season is what's hurting it for me in this third season. Oh, yeah? Does that make sense? No, yeah. <laughs> You've explained this to me. You're, you're totally on the ball, but can you explain it to people who don't know what you're talking about? Yeah, at, at, when the when the show first started, I was really liking that the boys had their own personality. It was something different. Like, they weren't, like, just mimicking each other. They weren't each other's shadow and just agreeing and saying the same things over and over. Like, right. it was really cool to see they had their own personality. But right now, it's really hurting because it's too many characters, too many personalities. And Scrooge is getting lost and forgotten, man. He, he's, like, drifting away. There are way too many characters on this show now. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and, and they're cramming in the – again, guys, this is just my opinion. I feel like they're just cramming so many cameos in, in there. The storyline is hurting from it. Just just my opinion, my observation, I, you know. I didn't mind the cameo thing when it made sense. Like, Don Carnage was the star of a full episode, and the Darkwing, stuff was, the Darkwing mm-hmm. stuff was great. I know you don't disagree with the Darkwing stuff. Mm-hmm. But now I feel like Chip and Dale and Goofy, and I just feel like – None of this really belongs. None of it pays off. And it just it's just there for the fan service. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if this stuff wasn't there, I think the episodes would be stronger. But yeah. this is the stuff people are really paying attention to, unfortunately. So we're probably just going to keep seeing more of it. Yeah. You know, and I agree with you about some of these cameos are being forced. Uh, I know we're going to sound biased on this one, but I think this still be cameo worked. Um, but the I was Chippendale th- one... Mm. That well, that's terrible, man. The thing with Steelbeak is he was the villain in the episode. So even though I didn't like that it wasn't Rob Paulson, he mm-hmm. had the whole episode to get fleshed out. Yes, I but agree. But the, the Rescue Ranger thing was pointless. It was just, it made no sense. It didn't need to be there. And it was just mm-hmm. there to be like, hey, look, it's the Rescue Rangers. Everyone get excited. But they didn't play into it. Yeah. At all. Mm-hmm. So okay, I, well. <laughs> I totally feel you. I totally feel your disappointment. I'm a little bit more invested in the show than you are, so I am yeah. going to stick with it. And I know you'll come back when the Darkwing Duck stuff happens, so we can talk about it here. Okay. But I, I understand. I understand how you feel about it because I definitely think the second season was was really good and it ended on a high note. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the air kind of got let out of the balloon, kind of. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's kind of limping along now, waiting for something big to happen. And maybe yeah. something will. We'll just have to wait and see. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, so Mike, what episode we got going on today? What are we talking about today? Okay, we're talking about a really interesting episode. Um, it's called Heavy Mental, um, mm-hmm. which obviously that title is a play on the uh, the, the phrase heavy metal, of course. Um, really quick, this wasn't the episode's original title, though. No? Nope. Um, no, the original title was supposed to be The Andromeda Brain. And that title was based on a 1969 Michael Crichton novel, which became a 1971 sci-fi film. It was called The Andromeda Strain. 
So they mm-hmm. were going to call it the Andromeda Brain. It was probably a movie or a novel that Tad Stones and the writers enjoyed. I think Heavy Mental's a better title, though. Yeah, it's, it's a I lot. Sim- it's a lot simpler. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Heavy Mental. So now that we've told said the title, I guess a lot of you guys know what our problem is with this episode, but we're not going to tell you quite yet what it is. We'll, we'll tell you in about a, maybe a minute. <laughs> uh, okay, but before we get into that, Mike, what's our production air date order? Okay, so this one aired uh, Thursday, November 21st, 1991. Man, what a week, right? Negaverse, mm. Dry Hard, and this one. Um, <laughs> and it was, get this one, woof, this is early. This is 17th in production order. Mm-hmm. This is one of the first 20 shows. Okay. Really, really early one. Yeah, and, and one character gives that away, too. Yes, yes. We can tell right away in this episode that this is an early one for sure. Um, our story editor this time around was Dwayne Capizzi again. This is actually the last episode to air that he worked on. But funny enough, it was the first one he actually did. Oh, okay. So they did it backwards with him. <laughs> Completely backwards, yeah. Um <laughs> So we've been talking about Kevin Campbell and Brian Swenlin a lot lately. They did the last two episodes. They re- re- they wrote this one, too. Mm-hmm. I think this is their second or third episode. You know, it's a good script. I'll tell you that. I think the script itself is fine. And I think Terry McGovern kills it in this episode. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a good launch pad one. But there is one thing that drags the entire shebang down the toilet. Uh-oh. One thing that really Here we go. this episode. <laughs> Um, we go. <laughs> this one was animated by one of the worst studios I've ever seen. Worst. Um, this is a studio we're only going to see this one time. Mm-hmm. It was called Freelance Graphics or Freelance Animators. It goes by two different names. They were located in Australia, in New Zealand. And I think what, what happened is that this one was sent to the Australia Disney Studio And they did the layouts, which is, you know, a lot of the art that dictates what the animators are supposed to do. And if you look closely at it, you kind of can see the Disney Australia influence. But the animation bypassed that studio and went to freelance instead. Now, freelance was terrible. Like, it's not even an understatement, Will. This Mm -hmm. is a really bad studio. Um, It was founded in 1989 by a man named John Ewing. And I'm mentioning him because years before he founded Freelance, he worked for Disney on a few um, anti-smoking and anti-alcohol films. Uh, One he wrote was called Understanding Alcohol Use and Abuse. You want to know the Darkwing Duck connection? No. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. (laughs) You You want to know who wrote and produced it? Who's that? Tad. Oh, really? Yeah. In In 1980, I think it came out. Um, so this guy, and if you watch, this is the, the 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 short is on YouTube. Understanding alcohol use and abuse, you see this type of animation. He, he this is his style, and he founded Freelance in '89. Now, any any guy, any of our listeners who are fans of the Warner Brothers shows, know this studio for their work on Tiny Toons and how badly they screwed up Animaniacs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did lots of um, Rita and Run and Mindy and Buttons cartoons. They were truly terrible. Like, their animation is so off-model. They can't even do good key poses. The characters ooze from pose to pose. They look like... they. The characters look like they're filled with jelly. Like, it's very unappealing animation. It's re- There are animation mistakes galore. I know you have a bunch you want to point out when we get there. Yeah. It's, it's bad. And it's like... it's. For a studio like Disney to fall back on this studio, Mm -hmm. it just looks awful. Like only one other Disney show got to got to have Freelance screw with them, and that was Goof Troop. There was one Mm -hmm. Goof Troop episode done by Freelance. But after they did Animaniacs, Freelance dropped off earth. They're gone. They're they've been done for 25 years. Good riddance, because they're awful. Your your thoughts? Uh my thoughts is as a, a child. A child wouldn't catch this, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, a young child. Yeah. I think a teenager, he's gonna catch it. An adult is gonna tear it apart. And I think Disney's reputation was on the line and said we can't go back to that. You know? No, this this was definitely a one time thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely hurts other shows like Animaniacs a lot more because they were used a lot more on that show. And the biggest shame is the character they're having the hardest time drawing is Darkwing. The main character. <laughs> like Darkwing. Like Goslin, 
looks okay. Launchpad has his moments, but I can't tell you if there are any good drawings of Darkwing. He isn't. I, he he can be kind of hard to draw because he has the hat and the cape and the buttons and there's a lot to the costume, but they just can't draw him right at all. He looks awful. And if you think we're exaggerating, watch the first two minutes. That's it. You won't even have to go any further. Watch the first two minutes of this. And just, matter of fact, don't pay attention to anything else but Darkwing. Just watch Darkwing for the first two minutes. Yeah, if- Darkwing's a mess. I can draw him better with my eyes closed. <laughs> um, even their backgrounds are shoddy. Like, yeah, even the man. background, everything. I, like I said, I see a bit of the Australia, Disney, Disney Australia influence in some of the episode. But freelance oof what a terrible studio yeah. um i think we've harped about this uh this studio enough i think we should get started with the with the yeah. plot here yeah let's get with the plot and describe what we're actually talking about with dark queen here man um okay so let's start off you know dark queen's upset with lp with volunteering um he wants to go to the video store instead yeah but launchpad dragged him all the way to a shush base in the swiss alps <laughs> Yeah, and uh, but LP also had to deliver something, right? A stapler. <laughs> um, and Mike, this scene. I mean, we we just we've only said two things so far that, that happened, and Darkwing is just drawn so bad. His beak is huge, then it's thin, then he's like a size of a, of a little person, <laughs> and then he's normal size, like all in one shot, one take. Like his his hand swings and like. I'm like, what the heck? I remember I messaged you and said, dude, what the heck am I watching right now? <laughs> that, know, that's not, not the word I use. This, <laughs> if you're not ready for this, yeah, it catches you off guard with how bad it is. Yeah. And it's just a sad, it, like I said, it's sad that it's Darkwing that gets the worst of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they draw Launchpad okay. Launchpad looks all right. But every scene Darkwing's in, it's just, they could not draw him. Um... But aside from the animation, there's two notable things in this opening sequence alone. Mm -hmm. We are introduced formally to a character here who we've met before. Who is it, Will? Cerebellum. Yeah, we haven't seen her in a while. We haven't seen her since Justice Ducks, correct? Mm -hmm. But um, this is when we're supposed to meet her. Um, She's very mad scientist in this one. Like, Mm -hmm. a lot more manic and demented. Than she is in other episodes. I kind of like it. Also, um, I don't know if you noticed the running gag of Jay Gander Hooter mispronouncing Launchpad's name. Yeah, he called him a lawn chair, right? And later he calls him Stamp Pad. Um, there, there's another running gag that happens in this one. In oh, <laughs> the, running, the other running gag is actually really funny. Yeah. But this running gag is here because it was a running gag from the Double O Duck Tales. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were always calling Launchpad the wrong name in that one. And the writer's Bible for Darkwing Duck specifically states that Jay Gander would always get Launchpad's name wrong. But this is the only episode it happens in. Okay. So, they what is Sarah Bellum working on? She's working on a secret ray. Mm-hmm. It's called the Norma Ray. And just to describe that pun... Uh, Norma Ray, it's a play on a 1979 Sally Field film called Norma Ray. Uh, Norma <laughs> Ray spelled R-A-E as opposed to R-A-Y. So Norma okay. Ray, Norma Ray, it's, just, it's, a, it's a play on the title. Okay. Um, and the Ray is meant to give you psychic powers. <laughs> and they want to do this before Fal does it first. And um, in, in case you're thinking that Steelbeak is in this episode, yeah, no, he's not. Neither is Ammonia Pine. We meet our villain. It's a one-shot villain. And what's his name? Major Synapse. Yeah, Major Synapse. He's a dog. He's a general. He's decked out in general outfits. He's just a dog guy. Um, Fal has him working on their psychic division. But in his case, it's a punishment. He's been demoted for marching troops into an active volcano. <laughs> um this is um, the only time one of the Fal High Command is voiced by a woman. I don't know who's doing the voice, but funny enough, I learned recently from Tad Stones that that particular High Command leader, the one with the high forehead and the duck beak, was mm-hmm. always supposed to be a woman. Oh, okay. I this didn't know the, that. Yeah, I didn't know it. I didn't know that. I only learned it recently, within the last couple of months. And she, yeah, she's voiced by a woman, but it's the only time it actually happens. Tell me a bit about these quote-unquote troops Major Synapse has to give psychic powers to. 
He has two hippies. <laughs> yeah, two hippies. They don't have names yet. Um, the boy hippie is voiced by Danny Mann. You know, he is, of course, Jay Gander Hooter. And you see Danny Mann's range because this is voice is nothing like Hooter's voice. Um, the girl is voiced by a woman named Teresa Genzel, a born in 57. She's still active. Don't have too much to say. She was on Goof Troop, Raw Tunage, and Quack Pack. Um, she was one other Darkwing Duck character. Remember the, um, the, her name was Prina in Clash Reunion, mm-hmm. the one who always picked on Drake? Yeah. Yeah, she comes back in that episode, too. Okay. And, of course, these two hippies are dressed like hippies. They talk in 60s hippie slang. And, of course, Synapse is trying to get them to get some psychic powers. And they're, of course, they're terrible at it. Who is Synapse voiced by? Oh, I forgot. Yes, thank you so much, Well, I almost jumped right past that. <laughs> Major Synapse was voiced by a man named John Stephenson. He was born in 1923. Um, sadly, he passed away in 2015. Um, he was a major player for Hanna-Barbera. Oh, I know yeah. we always laugh, Hanna-Barbera, they all do it. But this guy this guy, I started with them in 1960 on one of their very first shows, Top Cat. Um, I think his best-known Hanna-Barbera role, though, is Mr. Slate from the Flintstones. Like, mm-hmm. if, you, if, if you guys listening have not put that together, but now you can hear Mr. Slate in your head, this is exactly the same voice he's using. Um, he voiced Mr. Slate in every Flintstone thing up until I think he passed away. And he was still working on, like, Scooby-Doo videos by the time he died. Um, he was also a major, major player in the original Transformers. Oh, yeah? Who was, he well. on, who, who was he on there? Do you know? I, no, I'm not sure. I don't think it's any of the major characters, but his, oh, okay. IMDb, his IMDb credits, like, credit him for every episode. Okay. So he must have done something in every episode. His only Disney, other Disney role was a character in one episode of Tailspin. But this guy goes really, really far back. So he's major synapse. Mm -hmm. So we jump back to the Swiss Alps, where Sarah Bellum wants a volunteer to get shot by the Norma Ray. Yep. Who volunteers? LP. Yeah, Launchpad. He's totally cool with it. And which really annoys Darkwing, because Darkwing just wants to go home. Yeah. He's a he's a crank throughout this entire episode. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and we flip flop back at the uh, foul base. Uh, Synapse is still trying to get these two hippies to lift an anvil with their minds. He's threatening them with he's threatening them with latrine duty. Um, and you know how that goes. You're a military guy. You know that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't think I'd want to do that. Um, <laughs> but he discovers the psychic readings are coming from, you know, obviously somewhere else. And that's because Launchpad's getting shot by the Norma Ray, mm-hmm. which seems to have failed. Nothing yeah. happens. Launchpad seems fine. Well, to them, it's failed. But in the background, it's oh, actually we, working. <laughs> you know what works. This next sequence is actually really funny, and it's got some great writing. I am going to go into a little bit of detail. Sarah Bellum gives Launchpad a psychic test to see if it worked. She hands him a balloon, tells him to lift it. And Launchpad keeps saying piece of cake because he's just going to use his hands and she keeps telling him your mind use your mind and as he's trying to lift the balloons what happens out the window he lifts the trees but nobody sees it Mm -hmm. so the next test is to light a match again piece of cake he says he's going to do it with his hands and she's like no your mind so he tries to light the match what happens out the window the trees are are on fire yeah nobody sees that so she gives him a box and says Guess what's in the box? And he goes to open it at, with his hands. And she's like, no, your mind, your mind. And he guessed. What does he guess? I don't remember what he guessed. A big red fire engine. Ah. Uh. <laughs> but when he opens the box, there is a piece of cake. <laughs> piece of cake. But what happens out the window? The fire show. The fire team show up, man. <laughs> you know what? Even the bad animation can't disguise how funny this is. The, the mm-hmm. writing is... Campbell and Swindling were great writers. Like even, their writing comes through, even though this one is so badly animated. Mm-hmm. But um, Sarah Bellum thinks she's a failure, so Launchpad and Goslin go home. I mean, Launchpad and Darkwing go home. Um, so what happens when they get home? Well, he finally gets his video. He's got his video. He's ready to pop it in. Yeah, Darkwing uh, Drake got some videos from the video store. Um, Goslin comes flying in, and Launchpad knew she was coming because he moved the lamp before she crashed into it. Mm-hmm. So hmm. How did he yeah. know that? Hey, those abilities are kicking in because he starts letting her know that the phone's about to ring and it's for her, you know, for Goss. 
And what crashes through the wall? Uh, the fridge. Yeah, here comes our running gag. This one, this episode is full of falling refrigerators. Like this mm-hmm. is the, I think it's pretty funny. I don't know about you. Yeah. Uh, the fridge flies into the living room, crushes uh, Drake's foot, and then it starts to snow. Mm-hmm. And Drake realizes, whoa, you know, with your powers, I'll be invincible. But we're not going to tell everybody. <laughs> but then... Yep. The Muddlefoot show up. <laughs> Muddlefoot show up. Uh, and invite them to a barbecue. Yeah. And that's when all hell breaks loose in the Muddlefoot's backyard. Yeah, just LPs all over the place. But, um, Mike, when we get to that bad animated scene, can you please stop there? And Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So- this is when Launchpad realizes every time he thinks something bad happens, mm-hmm. uh, Drake's tail catches fire, and Binky comes over, gives Drake some lemonade, which flies out of the glass, and then Binky comes back to give him more, and then what happens to Binky, Will? Uh, I'm trying to remember. She Oh, she refills it, the glass up, and I don't what's, remember what What's the, no, what's oh, the oh, mistake? Oh, the animation, she becomes transparent. Like, she's not even colored in. They forget to color her body in as she walks out of the shot. Yeah, man, it's so bad, Mike. It is oh, so bad. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. And then, all of a sudden, Launchpad's trying so hard not to think, but the Muddlefoot house actually rips off the foundation and begins to float. It's just levitating there in the air. <laughs> Drake goes in the kitchen to get some mustard. He gets crushed by another refrigerator. Um, Honker starts to fly through the air. I don't think Katie got a paycheck that week because Honker doesn't say a word. Yeah, but he's flying across the screen all, all throughout the scene, though. <laughs> Goslin's trying to catch him. Uh, Launchpad accidentally ices over the uh, barbecue. And when Drake tries to prevent her from noticing the barbecue erupts in flames and cooks his face... Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And Tank's in the scene, too. Tank has a couple of lines. And um, so they decide, you no, know, Drake decides we have to get Launchpad back to the, the Shush lab. Mm-hmm. This is this is out of control. Yeah. And Launchpad says, we better hurry up. Someone's about to steal the Norma Ray. And then what happens to Launchpad's head? Oh, it grows. It gets huge. And once again, just like Battle of the Brain teasers, does Launchpad have any hair? Nope. No, and that looks super weird. It's just a little orange thing sticking out of the top of this gigantic head throughout mm-hmm. the rest of the episode. So Synapse and his troops, they follow the brainwave patterns back to the Swiss uh, Shush lab. And initially, Cerebellum doesn't know who they are mm-hmm. and is totally cool with having more guinea pigs for her experiments. And we see a quick, a really morbid scene of her experimenting on a little lizard. yeah. And what happens to the lizard? He blows up. He explodes. <laughs> one, of the, one of the side effects is if you if you think while you're being blasted by the normal ray, your head explodes. Mm-hmm. Like, man, that's super morbid. And boy, does it pay off later. Um, she realizes they're a foul agent. It's too late. It's too late to do anything about it because Synapse shoots them both with the ray. Mm-hmm. Um, Darkwing and Launchpad show up. There's a quick shot of the Thunderquack painted the wrong way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think can- you caught that. <laughs> the canopy's totally painted blue. Um, and Launchpad finally figures out his head is getting bigger. Yeah, it's still growing. And it really bothers him. Like, he's really upset about it. Mm-hmm. So Launch- he- Darkwing decides to leave Launchpad there, goes in, and too late because these two hippies now have psychic powers. Mm-hmm. And he tries to get an entrance, and they smash him against the wall. So, and, launch, and Darkwing goes, I am the misshapen blotch that stains your walls. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, really quick, though, I'm just going to backtrack for one second. Before Go his for entrance, something hit, oh, almost hits DW. Oh, another refrigerator falls. Yeah. Okay, and now let's go back. <laughs> and that's why DW tells Launchpad to stay by the plane. Um, so right. now the two hippies are wearing their supervillain outfits, and they have names. Hot They've Shot. Named Hot Shot and Fly Girl. Mm-hmm. Fly Girl has not aged well. <laughs> did, you, did you watch In Living Color growing up? Yeah. The yeah, Fly me, Girls. <laughs> me too. Um, I want, someone once said, why is Hot Shot's name Hot Shot if he can do fire and ice? Shouldn't his name be Freezer Burn? Freezer Burn. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great name? Um, mm-hmm. So Hot Shot can do fire and ice, and Fly Girl can make things flow. Mm-hmm. And he um, said Sarabella bobsledding. <laughs> yeah, they put Sarabella in a bobsled, and she's gone. We don't see her again in this episode. Mm-hmm. She only comes back one more time. 
Okay. So we have we she's almost done. Um. So DW ends up getting crushed by a snowball, a cow, a Swiss yodeler, and then gets his butt burned by uh by hot shot. Mm-hmm. Launchpad shows up and tries to do some damage, but what happens? The uh, the building falls on them. Yeah, the entire entire house falls on Darkwing and Launchpad. Mm-hmm. The Darkwing gets knocked out. As much as I don't like Freelance's animation, the shot of Darkwing coming out of the house, trying to yodel and passing out, is actually pretty funny mm-hmm. because of how grotesque he's drawn. Um, so yes, yeah, Synapse realizes I have the ray, I have the psychic troops, and I have Darkwing Duck. High yep. Command's going to love me for this. Mm-hmm. So Darkwing's captured. And I don't know exactly what happens, but somehow, as Launchpad is struggling under the house, he materializes the lizard. Lizard comes back from the dead. And Synapse's wallet. Yeah. Which is important. It come, that comes back later. Mm-hmm. Um, so Launchpad, you know, he heads home. Darkwing's gone. He's, he's kidnapped. We finally, F- Goslin finally gets into the episode a bit more. And um, what, what happens between Launchpad and Goslin? Yeah, you know, he, uh, he, they're trying to figure out how to find DW or Synapse, and, but uh, the wallet is there, and Goslin figures it out or realizes it, and all of a sudden, LP just starts, like, levitating. Is that what he was doing, like, levitating yes. toward the address? Yeah, <laughs> and he has to because he accidentally flipped the Thunderquack upside down and crushes it. So they mm-hmm. have to, yeah, he suddenly starts to float, and Goslin um, basically ties herself to him with a skateboard. I love the musical score. I've never heard the score, uh, Mike. The score think, while she's skateboarding. I've never yeah, heard this one. I think Philip wrote that for this episode, and it never turned up in any other episode. Mm-hmm. This is unique just to this one. Yeah, and it's, it's a dope track, man. That's what I'm saying. Like this episode had a lot of good things going for it, man. Could you imagine if this one went to Disney Japan or something? <laughs> it would have been really good. Yeah. I mean, it's it's still watchable. I mean, the writing is fine and the characters are fine. Just the animation brings it down a lot. Yeah. Um. So back over at the um the little uh, foul headquarters they're at, they have Darkwing on ice. In a literally. Giant, <laughs> literally on a giant ice cube, and um, Darkwing basically spits at them. And Foul High Command says, yes, I recognize his trademark witty repartee. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, they, they're going to crush him with a giant anvil, which they call a duck smasher. Mm-hmm. Funny line by Darkwing. That's the second biggest duck smasher I've ever seen. But um, decides to prolong the execution by making a list of demands. Yep. And forcing Fly Girl to hold the anvil all the way up in the air, even though it's straining her. Luckily, that buys Launchpad and Goslin a lot of time. A lot of time. <laughs> a lot of time. Because Launchpad suddenly gets a vision. Mm-hmm. And Goslin can see like a mental video in his giant forehead of Darkwing getting crushed by the anvil. Yeah. So they know they have to hurry up and save the day. So they show up, and things, things get a little crazy. Yeah, Hotshot spots them up on the roof, and... Uh, they they go into a little battle, but LP sends them into space, Mike. It's a psychic fight. Yeah, Launchpad <laughs> does pretty good too. Mm-hmm. He's like he's like you're gonna take a trip. You're gonna smack your head on something, and Hotshot flies all the way into outer space. Yeah, mm-hmm. but then when he says to Goslin, coming right down, Hotshot falls on all of them, and they all land on top of the anvil, and the anvil flies all over the room and. Synapse starts to panic and tries to let High Command not see what's going on, and they save Darkwing. Goslin says to Darkwing, I know how much you hate crushed ice. <laughs> Which, remember, they say that in Dry Hard mm-hmm. as well. So Darkwing really does not like crushed ice. Um, so Darkwing is freed, and Fly Girl finally tosses the anvil at them. Launchpad stops it at the very last second and crushes them with it. Mm-hmm. So that's the end of them. Hotshot and Fly Girl are done. And yeah. for a moment, everyone forgets about Synapse. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't see him for a minute or so. And Darkwing still wants to keep Launchpad this way. Yeah, but LP's yeah. not feeling it one bit. No, he's like, my fly caps don't fit anymore. I look ridiculous. And Darkwing's like, okay, all right, all right, all right. And they, they want to hit the reverse switch on the normal ray. And it doesn't have one. Mm-mm. And that's when Synapse shows back up. And we get, I think, the darkest moment in any Darkwing Duck episode. Definitely one of the more disturbing moment, moments, I'd say. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, th- I don't know if you'd agree with me, but this is actually, this is actually pretty dark. 
Um, Synapse turns the ray on himself and tries really hard not to think. Does that go? How does that go for Synapse? Uh, he, he to me, he turns into Crane from Ninja Turtles. <laughs> his brain bursts out of his skull, swells up, and his whole head explodes, mm-hmm. and he dies. Well, he not, didn't die yet. Not quite, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he got real, his head got real big, and then remember Darkwing gets the ray gun and shoots at him, and he starts telling, you know, saying all these things that make him think while he's shooting it at him. Yeah, he, he turns into a gigantic brain with a face on the brain stem. Mm-hmm. Floating, in, floating up in the sky, he tells him he's a being of pure thought. Yeah, so Darkwing starts to pump him full of Norma rays, Asking, asking him questions. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny because a lot of the questions are pretty stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, Launchpad says, uh, "Do bees be? Do fish fish?" <laughs> and <laughs> and Launchpad and Goslin goes, "Why can't I get a decent raise in my allowance?" <laughs> and um, they overload him. He explodes. Now he's dead. Yeah. The explosion takes down the entire building, and when Launchpad sits up, how is he? His head is normal. Yeah, he's fine. Launchpad's back to normal. Yep. And he's they're all happy for it. You know, it's a happy ending. Launchpad's okay. And um well, what lands? We got one more thing. <laughs> yeah, one more thing as I get up to leave cuz they're going to hit the um the aviary supply aviation supply store to get Launchpad a new flight cap. Mm-hmm. Yes, as they walk away, what falls in front of the camera? The fridge. <laughs> one last refrigerator. Mm-hmm. It's it's a funny way to end it. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's that's heavy mental. Oof. Right. Okay, Mike. So with all that being said, I'm really curious. How many gas gun canisters are you going to give this episode? I'm, I'm really so, curious. I'm so conflicted because it's a good script mm-hmm. and the characters are fun. Even I'm not fond of the villains, but eh, it's okay. We got some fun Muddlefoot stuff. Mm-hmm. But the animation, man, oh my god. Like, <laughs> I, usually, I usually apologize for even the worst animation. Like I've been pretty kind to Kennedy recently, mm-hmm. but this is bad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them just a straight in the middle average score. I'm going to give them a two and a half. I think the script is just strong enough to give this one an average score. I think if it was a worse script, it'd probably be closer to like a one, even less. Mm-hmm. But I'll give it a up. I'll, I'll be nice. I'll give it a one and a half. One and a half. Okay. Okay. Dang, man, you stole my score, man. All right. Um, we don't gonna... talk about the score going in, guys. So it's always yeah. a surprise to each other. Okay. I originally was gonna give it a one and a half. I'm gonna stay with that. Um, the script is fine. The jokes are fine. The characters are fine. Lunchpad is great in this episode. You know, even when Goss shows up, the the villains. Like you said, they're not, not they're not something you want again, but for one time, you're fine. You know, they're 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 solid enough for one episode. Uh Synapse, you know, he's cool. Uh he's screaming a lot. You can tell he's frustrated. Uh the running gags constantly work on this one, but that animation, Mike. Yeah. On the main character is what really, really hurts it. That's I the one we, character you gotta get right, you know? I think we found the reason why this one aired so late. Mm-hmm. They probably were just like, oh, this one turned out terrible. Let's bury it deep into the uh, the schedule so nobody has to think about it. Could you imagine that this one aired at the very beginning of the show? Oh, man. Like, if it was, like, that sinking feeling, Beauty and the Beat, and then this one? Yeah. Oh, I'm, th- this is probably why they waited so long to air it. Regardless of our score, this is the one time. Ignore our score as far as the viewing of the plot. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because normally our, our score goes ma- mainly focusing on the plot or the yeah. villain. On this one time, ignore our score for the plot. Just ignore it. The animation is what really kills this one. Like, it's so bad. I don't want to watch it again. It yeah, really hurts. I'll it, give you, know? you that. All right. So I'll moving on that. from that, moving on from our score, Mike. Are we uh, going to score our villains? Are we scoring all three or just one? How do you want to do this? Let's score them collectively, just synapse and the two the two hippies. Okay. So let, let's do the two hippies first. What are you giving the two hippies? Um I'm gonna give them a two. A two? I think that I think the hippie thing doesn't make a lot of sense. I kinda wish it wasn't all that dated hippie stuff. Mm-hmm. But there's potential with them. Okay. You know, enemies with psychic powers. Mm-hmm. Um they brought him back in the comics. This time they were helping ammonia pine. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were crushed by another big duck smasher the same way. 
Um, but two, I'll give them a two because there's not much to them. Okay, I'm gonna give them a one and a half. Uh, All right. They start off too slow. Nothing's really happening with them. When they come on, they impact. They're exciting, but they're just, they're just not on there long enough for me, you know. So I'm gonna give them a one and a half. Uh, what are you gonna give Synapse? Uh, Synapse, I'm gonna give an, I'll give another two to Synapse. His main, the main thing that keeps him interesting is the voice acting. Yeah. And now, and now do they know exactly who this guy is and how much of a legend he was back in the '60s and '70s? And now that I, I can't not hear that voice, you know? Yeah. He's fine. The design isn't much, but he's he's okay. Mm-hmm. He's aggressive. He's mean. He talks about killing people. And I think what really brings him a little bit higher for me is that grisly death. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about, Bud Flood getting melted alive. This guy's head explodes. Twice. <laughs> like, that is really dark for any show, you know, let alone Darkwing Duck. So that brings him up a bit because you remember him. You remember okay. how he dies. So for me, I'll give him a two. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give him a two and a half. I'm going to go a little higher okay. on you on this one. I like Synapse. He's cool. Uh, he's very aggressive. Uh, he's he, he means business. He's yelling. He wants what he wants. You know, he wants, uh, he got demands. He's in charge. He's controlling the hippies. Even when they're the ones with the power, for some reason, they're still taking orders from him. You know? Is it? He's intimidating. Yeah, he's very intimidating. I, he he works for one episode. Would he work again? Eh, no. Nah, not for me, but for one episode, I'm going to give him a two and a half. He worked for this one episode. He's another way you know it's an early one. They're still trying to come up with new foul villains. Mm-hmm. Eventually, they just give up, and it's Steelbeak all the time. Yeah. Like, if this one was produced a little bit later, it probably would have been Steelbeak. I mean, his head wouldn't have exploded, but it probably would have been Steelbeak. Yeah. Um, there is one bit with the um, the two hippies I do like. It's such a minor thing, but... I, I might as well mention it. I love at the very beginning when they're blindfolded and they're trying to guess what's in front of them. Mm-hmm. And the boy hippie has his hands up in the air and he goes, Denver omelet. <laughs> <laughs> and then then she grabs um, Synapse's arm and she goes, it's a tub lard. Definitely a tub lard. <laughs> <laughs> so they can be funny. It's just the hippie, the groovy stuff is really dated. All right. The, the last thing I'm going to say about this episode, I think for teenagers and adults, it's a one-time watch because the animation is so bad, yeah. but the story will get you through it. You know what I'm saying? Like, regardless yeah. of how bad the animation, the story, the gags, it, it will get you through it where you're like, hey, it's not that bad. But for yeah. a child, mm. I think for a child, a child won't care about the animation. They'll enjoy it. It'll be fun to them. Well, over on Animaniacs, they tended to get paired up with bad scripts. You can only imagine how that turned out. <laughs> yeah, their their worst work was over on Animaniacs. Um, All right. So, Mike, anyway. what episode? Yeah, what episode we got next? Oh, man? we have a big one coming up. We have yeah. our second. We have our second to last Saturday morning episode. Oh. And a big one. We are going to be talking about Brush with Oblivion. All right. Yeah. We <laughs> get to meet on Splatter. That. We get to meet Splatter Phoenix. It's Honker's big episode. Mm-hmm. I think I actually think it's the best of the Saturday morning episodes. This might be one of the all-time greats. Yeah, it's um, Do we have anything special happening for this episode, Will? Well, we might. We we might. I'm uh, I'm not gonna go know any further on that. But uh, you'll Mike... be surprised when you find out what's gonna yeah. happen. As long as it happens. <laughs> All right, but uh, Mike, where can they listen to us at, man? Lots of places. We are so lucky we were able to get onto every podcast app, basically. So Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, Pocket Cast, Radio Public. Uh, go ahead and speak into your Amazon Echo. It'll play the newest episode for you there. Also, um, iHeartRadio and Pandora. Also, YouTube. I will keep plugging that virtual panel. Please, guys, it's middle of July. If you haven't watched it yet, please watch it. Um, also, all sorts of videos and stuff like that. Um, I think that's it. Also join our communities on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, the St. Canard Files of Darkwing Duck podcast. And mm-hmm. if you, if anybody who's listening who is interested, we also do Saturday night uh, Zoom chats at yeah. 8 p.m. Eastern, but they go four or five hours sometimes. So anytime you show up is fine. I don't know how often we'll do those as life returns to normal, as things start to open up again mm-hmm. um, in this in this country. It's crazy as it is. But if you're interested, contact Will. Let him know you want to do it. I think I covered everything. Okay, man. Let me give a couple of shout outs. I want to give a shout out to a new follower, Jennifer J. Quinn on YouTube and James McNamara also on YouTube. 
Uh, we also got another one, Scorpion Wins. So YouTube's been really growing. And then I want to give a, a shout out on uh, Instagram to Justin Smith. So those are my shout outs. Thank you guys for supporting us and thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it and uh, appreciate all the comments and feedbacks you guys have been giving us. Yeah, we've noticed. I mean, it's a few weeks out from when this drops, but we've noticed we've getting a lot more attention over on our YouTube page, for example. A lot mm -hmm. more comments. So if anybody's listening there and leaving comments, thank you so much. We're happy we're growing there. Mm -hmm. And sorry my responses are short, guys. I, I normally respond while I'm at work, so I can't really be typing that too much. So I apologize for that. You know, I'll work on better responses on there. But I, I am acknowledging most of them for most part. Uh, but that's it, man, guys. Um, make sure y'all tune in to next week episode for A Brush with Oblivion. That's we, the big honker one. And... We promise the animation on that one is a lot better than this. Oh, yeah. And we got a I, uh, nice villain on that one. So This is, again, one of the all-time greats. Yeah, man. All right. So, guys, make sure y'all stay tuned to us next week and stay dangerous. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>